Though it might not seem like it, we actually have control over our appetite to some degree. In this video, we'll be discussing the science of hunger and appetite and the corresponding hormones and how you can use this science to feel less hungry while on a weight loss journey while improving the health of your metabolism at the same time. The experience of hunger resides mainly in our brains, specifically in the hypothalamus, an ancient brain region involved in instinctual processes such as sex, sleep, thirst, and obviously appetite. Key hormones in your body communicate with the hypothalamus to either cease or initiate eating behavior depending on many different factors. These include leptin, ghrelin, insulin, glucagon, and others like peptide YY and cholecystokinin. Because hunger isn't as simple as an empty stomach, our behavior and most importantly what we eat actually has a huge impact on how hungry we are. This means we can actually control our appetite to some degree and we can do so through managing our hunger regulating hormones through what I'll call the three pillars of appetite control. One, blood sugar management. Two, slow absorbing foods. And three, healthful behaviors. Stabilizing your blood sugar is the fastest way to reel in an out of control appetite. When your blood sugar is stable, free from huge peaks and valleys, the result is sustained energy and a better connection with your real hunger cues. The hormone insulin is the major determinant of how stable your blood sugar is. The more insulin your body releases in response to a meal, the more unstable your blood sugar will be and the faster you'll feel hungry. Insulin has been called the fat storage hormone, but more accurately, its job is to direct energy from the food you've eaten into your cells for fuel. It's released in response and even in anticipation of meals in varying degrees depending on your individual body and the macronutrient you're eating. Sugar and refined carbohydrates result in a massive insulin response from our bodies, and this effect is amplified if we pair them with little to no other macronutrients. These foods were not available to our ancestors, so it's a little bit unnatural for us to be eating them, especially in the quantities and formats that we do today. When we eat foods like this, they're digested so quickly that they produce such a massive insulin response that too much of our available calories get forced into our fat cells for storage. When this happens, not enough calories remain circulating in our blood to be used as energy by our body. Without available energy, our body cranks up the demand for food and turns down our desire to move so that we can serve energy meaning we're hungry again faster than we should be and the food we just ate has been turned into fat, even though we needed it available in the blood for energy. Refined carbs equal white bread, pastas, white rice, and the most refined carbohydrate of all, table sugar. If you're wanting to feel fuller longer, consider these foods your worst enemies. They're absorbed so quickly by our bodies that they send our insulin and blood sugar skyrocketing, only to come crashing back down, leaving us prematurely hungry, unable to focus, and sometimes shaky and irritable too. Interestingly, many people start their day with this energy roller coaster all the time. The most popular breakfast foods are mostly refined carbs after all. Different. People have different insulin responses to different foods. Studies have shown that some lucky people can eat a cupcake and get only a moderate insulin response, while others get a massive insulin response from even slow digesting carbs. You really have to pay attention to how foods make you feel. Everybody reacts differently to different foods. I can't emphasize this enough. For a general idea of how different carbs are likely to affect um, blood sugar levels, we can take Take a look at the glycemic index, which I'll link below. Not surprisingly, the research says that the consumption of anything listed as a high GI carbohydrate may increase hunger and promote overeating relative to the consumption of items with a lower GI. Pillar number one, manage your blood sugar by staying away from refined carbs and simple sugars. If you find it really hard to give up refined carbs while on a diet, remember that you don't have to. You can lose weight just counting calories, but you're gonna have a much easier time sticking to a diet if you're not starving all the time. And your blood sugar levels will be stable, so you should feel a lot better and more energized as well. If you are going to eat them, try pairing them with another nutrient and sticking with smaller quantities. This will slow down your digestion a little bit and is healthier for your metabolism overall. Again, you may just be one of those people who only has a mild insulin response to refined carbohydrates, but generally feelings of hunger and issues with body weight are indications otherwise. But again, everybody is totally different, so you really have to pay attention to how you feel. Pillar two, slow absorbing foods, protein, fiber. So what should we eat then? 
Well, basically the opposite of refined carbs. <laughs> Foods that digest slowly produce stable blood sugar, long lasting energy, a reduced insulin response, and also impact our hunger regulating hormones in a positive way. Starting with protein. Protein is the most difficult macronutrient for the body to break down, so it takes the longest. In a quote taken directly from Science Direct, many studies show that dietary protein is the most satiating macronutrient since protein may affect appetite by its involvement with appetite regulating hormones. Glucagon and peptide YY are two key hormones impacted by protein intake. Glucagon is the inverse hormone to insulin. It's released when blood sugar levels become low and it helps us pull fat out from storage to be used as fuel. Meanwhile, peptide YY is similar to leptin in that it tells our brain we're not hungry and is linked to a decreased motivation toward food. Researchers studying adolescent girls found that a high protein breakfast not only resulted in greater feelings of fullness throughout the day, but a reduction in evening snacking compared to controls. Increasing protein to 30% of your daily total caloric intake has been shown in a ton of different studies to reduce calories consumed over the course of the day overall. I've just included the one study, but there are a ton. And honestly, in a nutritional science, it's very, not rare, but it's not often that there's so much of a consensus that doing something will get a certain result. So I'm very confident in telling you that if you increase your protein intake, you will feel more satiated. Fiber. Fiber promotes fullness in a bunch of different and beneficial ways. First, it slows the absorption of nutrients into our bloodstream. It's the reason high fiber fruits and vegetables, though carbohydrates, don't impact our blood sugar the way fiberless refined carbs do. Second, the volume of food we eat at a meal impacts satiety both psychologically and physically through stomach stretch receptors that sense when we have enough food in our bellies. Even the increased degree of chewing required to eat foods high in fiber has been shown to increase perceived fullness. Studies show that fiber increases satiety, decreases hunger, and reduces daily overall caloric intake. Fiber is also digested in the deeper chambers of our intestines. Refined carbs are broken down in the first chamber, while fiber makes it all the way through, stimulating peptide YY and cholecystokinin, two key hormones that tell us we are not hungry in the process. Um, interestingly, in patients who have gastric bypass surgery, those who have a type called Rue on Y typically experience the most weight loss. Hey guys, sorry, I messed this part up. So I forgot to mention that the reason that patients experience more weight loss with Rue on Y as opposed to other types of um, weight loss surgery is because the stomach is reconfigured so that food misses the first part of the small intestine completely and is instead digested in the deeper layers. This is really similar to what happens to us when we eat fiber, so that's why this bit is here. <laughs> this is thought to be the result of key changes in their hunger hormones stemming from this deeper intestinal digestion. The same hunger hormones that we can stimulate through a healthy intake of fiber. So I just thought that was an interesting and useful point. Pillar three, healthful behaviors, sleep, exercise, stress management. To get the most out of the other two pillars, you should also engage in other keystone healthy behaviors, adequate sleep, regular exercise, and stress management. If you don't, it's really like fighting an uphill battle. Our overall health and our body weights are linked and our hunger hormones are one of the key pathways that this occurs through. Sleep, inadequate sleep massively affects our hormones and in particular those involved with metabolism and hunger. As a result, studies show that individuals running on less than six hours of sleep per night report an increased sense of overall hunger and an attraction to high carb, high calorie foods. Lack of sleep directly impacts the hunger hormones leptin and ghrelin, decreasing leptin and increasing ghrelin. So if you've ever found yourself hungry all day for no particular reason, not enough or poor quality sleep may be to blame. Poor quality sleep has been called a potent psychological stressor. And as a result, also increases the stress hormone cortisol. Stress in our lives expresses itself internally largely through cortisol, which has far reaching effects on our health far beyond weight gain, but we'll limit the discussion to appetite here. Cortisol increases reported food cravings and overall intake of high calorie foods, which seem to truly offer a comforting effect through the release of feel-good serotonin. 
it's helpful to realize that, you know, although we don't have control over the stressors that might pop up in our lives, we do control our stress response and how we react to those stressors internally. Worrying about past or potential events, for example, is something that we do have total control over. A lot of people don't realize that indulging in these types of negative thoughts is a choice. And although it can be extremely difficult, especially at first, we are in control and we can choose not to engage with these types of thoughts. Meditation Meditation is a great way to work on your relationship with your thoughts and how you think about them. Something called metacognition. Exercise. Exercise is also a great way to lower your cortisol while at the same time providing some other hunger hormone benefits. It's been shown to decrease levels of circulating ghrelin while increasing peptide YY and resistant. In one study, overweight adolescents were put on an aerobic workout program for 32 weeks. The researchers found that exercise training increased total PYY and decreased resistin. These are favorable changes as PYY plays a role in decreasing appetite and resistin is linked to insulin resistance. It should be noted also that the exercise appetite link is somewhat controversial and in some people, some types of exercise might actually induce hunger. Controlling your appetite or suppressing your hunger sounds like some sort of like sketchy diet ad benefit. But all the tips I've given you today actually make you healthier. They're improving your metabolic health so you can get in touch with your real hunger cues and feel more satisfied with what you're eating. If your blood sugar is all over the place, if your hormones are out of control because of what you're eating, you're not gonna feel good and it can be hard to stick to a diet if you're essentially fighting your biology the whole way. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And next week, I am finally ready with my foodie beauty video. So <laughs> I think it's one of my favorite ones I've made to date. So I'm really excited to show you guys. And I hope everyone is safe and doing well during this really crazy time.